Uh, so I'm Joe Klein from Time Magazine, and this is a topic that when someone mentions it to me in the abstract, or when I think about it in the abstract, I get totally depressed. Um, but then, usually, when I'm on a panel or talking to people who are working in this area, uh, I get very excited by what they're doing and what can be done, and, uh, and, and just the, the velocity of change uh, when it comes to teaching and especially training young people for the jobs of the future. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce the panel and uh, we will go from there. On my immediate left, we have one of my favorite Congress members in all of history. <laughs> I've been doing this for 45 years. There may be none that <laughs> That, uh, that, that <laughs> match Jane Harmon in terms of her ability to, and willingness to think, to innovate, um, and to be courageous. She's now the head of the Wood Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Jane Harmon, next to her is, uh, you're not gonna get as good an introduction because I've known <laughs> yeah, Jane forever, right? right? But I'm sure you're really cool too. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is Gabi Zedelmeyer uh, from Hewlett Packard and she is in charge of, um, of uh, social innovation there. Next to her is Carlos Dominguez, um, who I just heard is Cuban Chinese. Cuban Chinese, Terrific. very confused. <laughs> Very confused. Uh, no, Cuba, we'll, we'll, we look forward to the day when we get the benefit of the great diversity and creativity of the Cu Cuban people. Um, yeah. Back again, because they were among my favorites. I think, by the way, Cuba and Iran. Thank you. I'm, I'm starting to feel like Jane now. <laughs> yeah, Cuba, Cuba and Iran are, are the two countries in the world with the greatest <coughs> mismatch between their government and their people. Carlos, um, Carlos is a senior vice president at Cisco. He, he's a futurist and an expert in innovation. Uh, and next to him is uh, Nodis Midaraki, um, who's got a big job. He's with the government of Greece, and he's the minister for economics and competitiveness. Uh, I'd like to start first with you, Gabi, and, uh, and then you, Carlos. Okay. And, <coughs> Why don't you tell us briefly what you're doing? So I do think there is um, there is both fire and hope out there. Uh, I work um, at Hewlett Packard in sustainability and social innovation, and that means that we go and work with our businesses and the labs, uh, and all of the skills of our I don't know over 300,000 employees on solving some of the critical societal issues, specifically environment, health, and education. And since we're talking today about this massive issue of, um, of unemployment, you know, I'd, I'd like to sort of um, dig a little bit deeper in, into what we're doing in that space. We've created a few years ago a program that's called HP Life Entrepreneurship Training to tackle exactly that issue. And we've built like 300 centers in 47 countries and built up a curriculum in over 20 languages so that kids could go and learn how to use IT to do a business plan, a marketing plan, to set up a website, and how to really run a business. But we realized that's really limiting because you only have these 300 centers. So the first learning from that was that we needed to take that whole curriculum up on the cloud. So now this is available for anybody around the world to download and, and, and apply. And the second learning I think that's really important to take away is that we now use that curriculum with all of our other partnerships that we already have and hopefully future partnerships that we're about to build. So we just um, agreed with uh, NACI in the US, uh, the National Association for Community Colleges, that we bring the curriculum to their community colleges because then you have this offline online combination. Also, we were able to um, sell 1.5 million PCs into Uttar Pradesh in India, and we will preload this program so that the kids will not only um, you know, have technology, but they also have an application, uh, junior achievement, and so forth. So the, the, the real learning here is that, um, that, that we bring existing partnerships and future partnerships together um, to, to create platforms around the world globally to then address this issue via this cloud-based training. Mm -hmm. Okay, Carlos. 
You know, Joe, l let me begin. I, I think most of you probably know what Cisco does, but I'll take uh, five minutes <coughs> to tell you that uh, we um, design, uh, build, and manage uh, large networks, and we're the uh, plumbers behind the Internet. Um, you know, in 1997, after experiencing hypergrowth, we had a very huge challenge where we couldn't find enough workers that could support the kinds of technologies that uh, we needed. And much like any other corporation, you begin by taking a journey to try to solve some of your very specific problems. And what we tried doing was how do we educate and train um, people on learning our technology. So in 1997, we launched a program called the Cisco Networking Academy. Uh, it's grown exponentially. We're uh, 10,000 academies today uh, in 165 countries. We've graduated over 4 million students. Right now there's 1.2 million uh, students in the program. And there's a lot we can share, but you know, what, what I'd like to take away, although ours was to solve a very specific problem, mm -hmm. um, we kind of broke the mold in a lot of areas. And what, what I find the challenges in creating jobs for the 21st century in, a, in the world in which we're living, which is very different than anything we've experienced in the past, you know, you can't approach the problems in the same way we did in the past. And when you try to be very creative and out of the box, uh, you get a lot of resistance because it's very different. So, for example, all our curriculum is delivered uh, computer-based. You know, it's leader-led but computer-based. A lot of the learning institutions when we did that said, oh, it can't be done, right? So we pushed, you know, those models. We introduced uh, a lot of tools that were available today. We've gamified everything. So who said that learning has to be boring, right? Why not make it fun? So we have gaming uh, things. We virtualized a lot of things. Instead of spending money in real hardware, we virtualized the equipment and you can run all these tests. So we broke a lot of ground and we did it also with very unique partnerships. If you see how we've rolled it out, some of it have been partnerships with governments, others have been with inst uh, educational institutions. We've done it with uh, local uh, cities and government. We've done it with community colleges. We've done it with learning centers. So the point is to solve these problems is how do you leverage the lessons learned from companies like HP and Cisco? How do you take it into governments uh, and kind of modify it and really try to address the issue? Have you had any success with that? With oh, we have a lot. I mean, a lot with of- With governments? Yeah, we, we work with them. But again, it, you know, we, when we approach it, Joe, it's, it's really specific in our, ta in our domain. What I'm saying is why not take these models that work and scale it to other industries and to be able to do it in a much broader scale? Okay, I, I'd like to ask you notice, uh, for, um, you've heard these two very enthusiastic people who are doing wonderful things. You have a huge problem in Greece. I think you told me earlier, 60% unemployment in young, among young people. What do you need? And, um, and, and how much is what they're offering mm -hmm. useful to you? Joe, what the corporates are doing is a lot of good work bottom up, but policymakers have to be concerned top down. I heard at the beginning of today's event Dr. George Loothetti speaking very passionately about the need to empower young people in the developing world. But I would argue that the developed world has similar negative structural trends. When I attended a year ago the annual World Bank Ministerial Summit in Tokyo, you heard all the ministers from the developing countries saying their biggest challenge is to create jobs for the young population. But then you heard the ministers from the developed world saying exactly the same thing, that the, if you look together at the developed world, we're suffering from an <coughs> aging population relative to the developing world, we're suffering from a high level of debt and reducing relative Competitiveness. If you look at the latest UN data, most of the FDI now doesn't come to our part of the world. It's actually going to the developing world. So we need, as Europeans, and I would dare to say that there is not yet sufficient leadership at the European level to solve the problem, we need to think top down. What are we doing in Greece, for example? We're working on five policy pillars. We're working on restabilizing the economy. And I'm pleased to say that this year we're going to meet a budget objective and the recession is better than we thought. We're working on structural reforms, and I think fiscal and structural is where most of the European and developed world countries need to work. We need to rebuild our competitiveness. We're working on changing the investment climate, is what the Concordia Index said before, as the readiness of the economy. We're trying to enhance liquidity, which is still a problem in some parts of the world, and we're trying to find catalysts of growth through privatizations. But this is a top-down. Bottom-up, we're also working together with the industry. A lot of uh, big multinationals are now increasing their production in Greece. They're increasing their R&D capacity in Greece. We're trying to empower young people through entrepreneurship to develop new projects. 
I'm very pleased to say that Greece, who had 700 million of inflows this year from big multinational investing in startups in Greece, something that was far from our culture till a couple of years ago. We're working on a dual apprenticeship program, learning from the German example on how do you empower people not only in education, but also in the workforce with practical example. But I think the key point for me, and that's what I want to leave today, is that finding jobs for the entire young population in the developed world will be a big challenge, <clears throat> and the generation that follows ours is the first generation probably after the, the Second World War, which doesn't have the confidence that they will live better than the previous generation. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's certainly true here in the United States. Um, in fact, the thing that distinguished us from every other country in the world uh, up until the mid-70s was one polling question. Do you think next year will be better or worse? And up until the mid-1970s, Americans always said next year would be, will be better. And now, not so true. So, Jane, what's happened here? And, uh, and in terms of youth getting young people into the market and getting them the skills that we need, because there are, dry, I mean, you know, we are light 70,000 welders in this country. We need 70,000 welders, and our school system just can't seem right. to provide them. Well, let me say a few things. First of all, when I arrived this morning, Joe told me he was sick, and I shouldn't give him a hug. <laughs> I gave him a hug anyway. <laughs> there are very few people whose germs I will accept. <laughs> uh, and he's showing off now. Uh, I am a recovering politician. I'm trying to wash my hair and wash my brain out from where I have recently worked. That does not mean that there aren't many talented people in both political parties in the United States Congress now. I served there for nine terms, um, 119 dog years. <laughs> uh, very, but, but the place has become dysfunctional. And the reason I tell you this little piece of history is because it is relevant to answering this question. Um, here is the private sector innovating. That's fabulous. Here is a government struggling to get to the right policies to employ its workforce, especially its young workforce. Here is the country in, in which you all are now, whether you are American or not, that has probably still the strongest economy in the world, surely the strongest military in the world, the most wealth in the world, and we are not leveraging the resources we have to fix this problem. And uh, I, I guess I would, I, I want to change the subject f for a minute, but I mm -hmm. think you'll approve of it, Joe. But I think the biggest failure uh, of government policy in this country right at the moment, and there are plenty of failures, including this risk that our government may close in four days and that we may default on our debt. But right up there is our failure to enact comprehensive immigration reform. Because when you look at who the innovators are and who has created the wealth in this country and who the future entrepreneurs are, uh, at least 25% or 50% are immigrants. And the graduates of Caltech, for example, 50% of the graduates of Caltech right now have to return to their countries, can't stay here even if they choose to, and most of them would choose to, and each one of those people immediately could establish five supportive jobs to whatever that person wants to do. Here's why I wanted to change the subject, because I'm assuming this is an international audience and at least we all care about that. I wanna know what we say to the kid in Yemen, in the boonies of Yemen, who's maybe, who's clearly unemployed and uneducated, and deciding right now whether to strap on a suicide vest. And I think we need a message, not just from the United States, but certainly from people, the, Im the immigrants or the kids of immigrants sitting here uh, to, that, to that kid, that is a message of hope. That if you don't do that, uh, you will find a job in your country, you can join, you can become educated uh, in the cloud, you can do something. And we don't have any answers for that, uh, good answers yet. And until we get good answers for that, I think uh, are we <coughs> stuck in this paradigm of fear uh, against these asymmetric terror attacks by people who don't really hate us, but who have been brainwashed in a, in a system uh, where uh, just a few people hold all the, all the juice. And, and it worries me terribly. And I think it relates specifically to this issue of where are the jobs. Part of the answer to that, 
problem, I think, is sitting in this room. He was certainly on a, uh, an earlier panel. His name is Ron Bruder. Ron, are you out there somewhere? You want to stand? I don't see you. Anyway, Ron runs a program called Education for Employment in the Middle East. He's an American businessman. Um, and he, uh, and, and over, after 9-11, he took a tour through the region to see what people wanted. And uh, what they wanted was for their kids to have real skills. And that involved two things. It involved soft skills, like looking your boss in the eyes, shaking his or her hand, not screaming and uh, running out of the building when you're criticized. And it also meant uh, learning skills that actually uh, are in need in Jordan air conditioning repair people, for example. Uh, and and uh, I'm wondering, Carlos and Gabi, let's go back to you. The people who are taking advantage of your programs, um, I understand how technology can, can help, can leverage learning. Um, where do they get, where do they get, do they get the skills uh, to deal with prospective employers? Where do they find out where the jobs are? So, so I'll, I'll take a crack at it. So on the, on the first question, um, you know, it's not only technology training. You have to prepare people for work. There's a lot of soft skills on communications, on being able to interact and, you know, be able to write and do all the things that, uh, you know, are required. So actually, as part of the program through Game <coughs> of so we're actually teaching a lot of those, you know, soft skills. And in addition to that is there's communities being built uh, in an electronic fashion since they're all connected anyway on how to share jobs and, and what to do. I, I just want to add one more, one more comment, which I, which I think is really pertinent to this dialogue, is, you know, this is a really big problem. This is not a, uh, an easy one to solve. And, and what I see with big problems is we get um, kind of stuck in trying to find a solution that's going to fix it. And the reality of it is uh, no great idea ever started with the problem being known. If you think about it, you know, everything starts with an experiment. Um, you try something out, and, and very few ideas that are really, really big today, whether it's Google or something else, actually started doing what they, what they set out to do. So, so one of the things we need to do here as a group is how do we think about unleashing a lot of experiments yep. and monitoring those experiments, learning from those experiments, and for each of us to kind of go about it and do it a little bit different. Um, and if we did that, I think we could begin to arrive at the problem. So how do you take this big thing and make it much smaller. And I, I also think technology can only be an enabler. It's not the solution in and by itself. That's why it's so important to work with these local partners. So I've just been, we've just been to Tunisia to work with the education system there. I was in Saudi last week in order to bring our programs exactly to the folks. Same thing in the UAE. It is a mix between what we can bring that then gets uh, basically implemented locally. And so you get this mix of offline and online. And one of the, the, the modules that we're teaching is exactly the 21st century skills. And it's also creating this mindset of the 21st century. People, our, our students <coughs> understand that you know, statistics say that 65% of those that are in high school today will end up in a job that doesn't even exist today. So they have to, they have to think and act like entrepreneurs, whether they work for HP or Cisco or, or whether they have their own shop. You need to invent yourself and reinvent yourself and you need to constantly sort of take a look at how can I take advantage of what's out there, specifically in information technology, to drive transformative change. And as I said earlier, mm. a lot of the kids, uh, at least in the more mature and Western markets, they use a lot of the information technology for a lot of entertainment and, and, and communications, mm -hmm. but they don't drive transformative change. When we were just recently in Kenya, and you take a look at what the Kenyans have done on basic mobility to transform their society, it's unbelievable. unbelievable. So this mindset is going to be key to changing, basically, the attitude, because there's a lot of tools out there that kids could utilize in order to really you know, create a, a good future for themselves. I've, I've written about this subject and about education for f at least 40 years now. Um, <laughs> Time sure flies when you're getting old. <laughs> um, and in my experience, um, back in the 80s, there were two politicians who said to me, government is going to, is, is going to be the last major institution to enter the 21st century, and we have to do something about that. 
Those two politicians were the governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, and a young Republican activist in the Congress named Newt Gingrich. And it seems to me uh, that a lot of this innovation immediately faces roadblocks when it gets up against the education establishment. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to ask notice first, uh, and then Jane, notice how, how has your ministry changed? How have, you, how, how have you streamlined and made it easier for innovation to take place in Greek education and in the hiring of young people? And specifically, how have you dealt with your unions? First of all, I would say, I'll say that I, I agree that the solution for this problem will come from the private sector. I come from the private sector. I'm not a traditional government person. Um, I think <coughs> that the government can only do a couple of things. One is policies, make the, the country more open for investments and trade in a national or international level, fund initiatives, and we're trying to fund, for example, now initiatives at a European level through the youth initiatives and the youth guarantee for young people to get the kind of skills that the market needs for them to go into jobs. And um, also subsidize job creation at difficult times in a counter-cyclical policy to the extent that fiscal uh, environment allows you to do so. We will be slower from the private sector, I admit that. Uh, but we are taking the policy, for example, the area of education, trying to link more education with apprenticeships, and I think that's a critical change in the Greek educational system. We are trying to bring the private sector closer through this dual system with the universities. Uh, at the same time, uh, we encourage people to attain education not only in the public sector. I mean, there's a very dynamic private sector of education in Greece and throughout Europe, and Greek students have always been very open in traveling around the world and get the skills, and they then come back to the country. And that has created a very well-educated workforce which gives us hope that we can get, get through the crisis. One thing we all know, need to be aware of is that there is a risk throughout Europe of a lost generation, and this lost generation is a big challenge to our democratic values. You see what's happening politically in a number of European countries where you have non-mainstream political forces coming through, the kind of forces we are trying to avoid in democracy as a reaction to this huge unemployment. So I think in a, in a European level and in a global level, we need to invest more to ensure that we don't have a lost generation. Okay. I don't think it's just a question of government investment and government policy. Uh, Joe raises the issue of unions. Some unions are highly creative and helpful in the education space, and some are absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And the innovation that's happened in American education, by and large, in the last two decades, at least in my observation, some of it has come uh, because of people standing up to education unions. Some of them have adapted, that's a good thing. Some of them have not, and they have found their enrollment decreasing substantially because parents insist and, and societies insist that kids get better education and have better teachers. And the oldest teachers don't necessarily deserve protection if they're not the best teachers, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it's, some of this has been dragging the unions into the future, but part of it, ha, you know, as everyone has said here, has had to rely on private sector innovation. Two new tools that matter, and they were described here. One is creating um, uh, technology tools beyond the classroom uh, through the internet uh, to educate kids, and there are all these experiments now with lots of teachers that we know, in fact, they're now our generation, who are teaching millions of people through these online uh, exercises all around the world. So that's, that's kind of uh, one thing that's happening that I, that I think is very interesting. The other thing is games. Uh, one of you mentioned it, Carlos mentioned it. Uh, at the Wilson Center, we have a science, we, we're the only uh, think tank, do tank, that has a science and technology program uh, that is using games to teach people, for example, about the budget. We have a game called Budget Hero that has been played a million and a half times, and everyone says, uh, and I agree, of course, I'm totally objective, that it is <laughs> the best tool ever to teach people about everything that's in the U.S. budget, uh, U.S. federal budget, and how hard it is to make the, the, the cuts <coughs> and, and trades necessary to bring it into balance over a 10-year period. It's, it's a complicated game. You play your values, so it's not just a simple exercise. Uh, but people love it and play it at all ages and in both political parties. We're going to do a game now on energy. 
uh, which will show you what trades need to be made for energy independence in parts of the world, uh, clean energy versus dirty energy, et cetera, et cetera, conservation. But my point is, teaching this way is also hugely useful. And these kinds of tools do not depend on state-run education systems. I think that's where the future is. And, and uh, just one last thing. I mean, uh, Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich have two of the most creative minds that have ever been in politics. They're not in politics anymore. Right. They're in platforms where I would guess, if you ask Bill Clinton, I, I think he feels more productive now as the head of the Clinton Global Initiative and this world citizen than he did as president of the United States. Mm -hmm. He's certainly making a lot more money. Um, Carlos. <laughs> um, I mean, $700,000 for a speech in Nigeria? Give me a break. Whoa. Carlos, what's this? You're just jealous. <laughs> Carlos, how does this look? You were saying before that, that, you, that, that you meet roadblocks from the education establishment, from the education institutions. Could, could you be a little bit more specific about what institutions we're talking about here? You know, I, I think Jane mentioned a couple of ideas with gamification. And, and my point, uh, Joe, is you know, our world today is radically different than what it was when I grew up. And, and I, you know, if you think about it, over the last 25 years, we've had the birth of the internet, social media, and mobility. You know, we have these devices with us all day long that we rely on, and they weren't around 25 years ago, right? We're hyper-connected. So we've moved from a world that we've lived that was very local. Majority of mankind was born, lived, and died within 30 miles. Uh, here we are now. Anything that happens in the world, within minutes, we have it on our phone. So when you look at the, that particular context, you can't approach solving problems of today getting and using history. And the biggest mistake I see in most organizations is when you present a problem, they say, oh, I saw that problem in the past and here's the solution. Because you're wrong. The environment right. is totally different. So the roadblocks that I'm receiving <coughs> and I see are, are, are not really purposeful. They're really roadblocks of history. They're roadblocks that are anti-change because change is really hard to do. Right. And, and it's the reality for the individual. But you're not going to name names? Well, it's the large institute. I mean, if you think of what Coursera is doing and all of the online things, they're pushing, you know, uh, higher learning, and particularly in the traditional large institutions and universities. And I applaud all of the universities that are actually experimenting with it. And I mean, it's a free model. Is that going to be the model of tomorrow? Probably not. There'll have to be a different economic model. But I applaud the fact that they're experimenting and trying new ways to reach students. And and you know, in this new world, distance is dead. Who has to say? that a university's right. territory only is within their geographical boundaries. Right. I mean, what we also see a lot in, in schools, and my kids uh, have gone to school in, in Germany, the IT room is separately, I think it was in the basement, and, and <laughs> it was used to teach IT, and it wasn't used to teach physics and chemistry and, and the languages. Mm -hmm. You could really immerse yourself. I mean, this is what we've done over the last three years, worked with 80 universities around the world to come up not only with, with games for the kids to play, but games for the kids to write. We have created virtual labs so kids can sit in India or in Africa and do real-time experiments that happen in, in labs somewhere around the world. So it's not a simulation. It actually happens. It makes the learning experience really, really, really different. And I want to say something also about these massive open online courses. We have a great partner in the University of the People. They don't only offer massive open online courses, but they offer a degree to kids from around the world for free. It's a tuition-free degree that you can get either in computer science or uh, in business. And this is quality education. The professors are, are volunteers from some of the very best institutions in the world, and they are leading the way in terms of how things are, need to get done. So there's a, a lot of great offers. People need to understand how to can tap into it. Can I just add it. one yes. thing to that? It's not just kids who are learning. Oh, yeah. It's adults. Yeah. And as Gabby said, a lot of the jobs of the future don't exist yet. Uh, Tom Friedman um, says, average ain't good enough anymore. And yeah. He's no. right. Yeah. And to compete for the jobs of the future, whether you're a kid or whether you're old, uh, you've got to upskill yourself. Absolutely. And that is part of the excitement of this whole exactly. virtual it's, He, he also system. said it's not your parents' job market anymore. And right. that means on right. all the time. You just invest in yourself and you learn and how to utilize basically everything that is at your fingertips. Let's, let's just clarify one point. You know, it's said, those who can do, those who can't teach. And I will dispute that because I wouldn't be sitting here 
today but for one high school English teacher who was an absolute genius. How do you deal in the cold but fun world of technology with the need for individual inspiration? You want, you want to take first? Yeah, a, a lot of these platforms that we're creating, as I said earlier, then are brought to communities. Either they're brought to community colleges where, again, you know, we have this one-to-one, -one mm -hmm. basically, interaction. A lot of peer communities uh, exist out there where, where kids help each other. So I don't think it's either or. I really do think these things need to go hand in hand. But people need to take advantage of what's out there and then basically bring it to the curriculum that they're teaching. And we need more openness for that. That's why we are creating specific modules for teachers so that teachers know how to embed that into their classroom. And once they see what's out there, you, we get a lot more people really buying into it. I think there's a lot of fear still uh, out there. But once they see what can be done, you know, you, you got them. And, 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 and then you have both, you know, the social interaction as well as, you know, the, the information. That's a great point. You know, Joe, my... And, and I get back to the experience <coughs> recently at a, at a uh, college, and uh, we were talking about going online, and that issue came up. And they gave me 40 reasons why it's not going to work. You know, we, we're this type of school, and we pride ourselves in our teacher-to-student ratio. And I said to them, you know, you're, you're making decisions based on what you know today, not on what's going to be available tomorrow. And I walked them through a very simple example uh, there's, a, there's a startup that's just going to be putting out a product called Oculus Rift. It's a pair of goggles that gives you an immersive experience. And if you put them on, and I showed it to them, um, you can take a tour of a home in Tuscany. And it feels through a joystick that you're walking through the room. It's very immersive. It's 360 since it's here. And if you start putting haptic interfaces in your hands, like gloves that are there, you can see a vase and grab it and actually feel it. Mm -hmm. So my point is, you know, at some point in time, if we're all virtual, who is to say that we can't congregate on not a Tuscan house, but on a campus, and we can all interact with, with people and almost like if we were virtually there? Uh, can I take from the last point? I, you know, but, but, go, ahead, go ahead. I think you raised a very interesting poll, uh, question for policymakers. How do you motivate the teachers at a difficult time where they have the unions from the one hand trying to complain against change? And obviously, we need to <coughs> a lot of things in our educational system to make it more adaptive to people's needs. How do you motivate teachers at a time where fiscal constraints mean you have to reduce salaries? And that's one of the toughest questions we have to answer. On the, we're trying to bring opportunities for the young people by trying to create an entrepreneurship spirit, which means that it gives the opportunity to teachers to make a change for the students by providing opportunities for the students. Would that be enough as a motivator? That's a question we need to see. But it is a big challenge, and I have to recognize it. Yeah, maybe this dates me, but I'm remembering your, your question, uh, Joe. You're really saying a human being motivated you mm -hmm. to become what you are. Um, and and uh, what you are is pretty special, my friend. thought I'd put that out there. Uh, but does everyone agree? Do you like Joe Klein? <laughs> oh, please, stop this. All right. So they, I'm going to make never, myself obnoxious. And, that, and it's a, never it, mind. But, but I don't think you can take people out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I there will always be a role for a parent, a teacher, uh, um, some um, member of, of, of uh, some faith institution, a friend, a this or that, who will motivate individual people. I, I mean, it scares me to think we could live yeah. in a virtual world no, with a joystick no no. and that would be the end. I mean, kissing somebody with real germs is still <laughs> fun. And um, strangely, and and so I. And we'd I all need our own individual tech person because I got to tell you the amount of times I have to go to the tech department. Yeah, but timing, that's that's our generation. Yes. Kids' brains are wired differently. They don't no, need but, rule books. But but I am saying that I think as as you think forward, and again thinking about this lost kid in the boonies of Yemen, how do we motivate this kid? I don't think it's just to surround his head with technology mm -hmm. that maybe he has the skill sets for. It's. It's Absolutely. to touch this kid, yeah. and I think that actually takes a human touch at some level. Okay, we have about five minutes left, and, uh, and so I, we'll go to some closing comments. Uh, but here's, here's mine, uh, and, it, and, and it has every bit to do with being my age uh, and our age, although, um, anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, if, <coughs> if you go back to those who can, do and those who can't teach. Um, those who can't teach, teach education. 
And uh, there is a major problem in our education establishment now, which dates back to 40 years in my mind, uh, and this may be true in other countries, when the actual training, there's a difference between education and training. Education involves your mind, training involves your mind, your heart, and your body. Um, and uh, the military does training brilliantly in that regard. And 40 years ago, it was decided that training was inferior to education uh, because a lot of minority students in this country were being placed in voc, voc ed programs, vocational education programs. And a, a philosophy, a, almost a theology grew up that every child needed to go to a four-year academic university. Recently, I was in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where vocational education has become a major uh, training ground for the workers of tomorrow. When I was a kid, you'd go into the uh, auto shop and there'd be this old jalopy that the, you know, the, the, the thugs in school would bang on with hammers. Uh, in, at West Tech in, in, um, in Phoenix, there were 14 new cars with computer uh, you know, analysis provided by the local auto dealers of Phoenix. And that's only one of 30 programs uh, for in, in the voc ed system. And now what you're finding is that advanced placement kids, right. the smartest, are taking voc ed classes in the afternoon so that they can learn to be physician's assistants and, and paralegals so that when they go to college, they can make some money and not have a tremendous burden of debt when they go to medical school and law school. This seems to me to be a really optimistic vision of how we can match kids to skills. But I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to educators who've said, oh, but the, everybody should have a four-year college education. Uh, I think that uh, what the people on this panel are saying is it has been very important. People my age, to get back to it, say, well, we tried that and it didn't work. Well, that was 20, 30, 40 years ago that we were trying things. Uh, it's a new generation, it's, an, it's a new world, and quite frankly, we, our sell-by date is passing, <laughs> and, uh, and we have to really look to the younger people, like the younger people on this panel, uh, and the more visionary older people to, uh, to make this happen. Now, let's just go quickly down the row, and when we start with you. I think we've had a lot of interesting uh, points in, the, in today, and I think there is room for a, a PPP between the private and the public sector to get more skills, more appropriate skills for the young people and empower young people. But if you look top down, the big challenge is how do you get the global growth you need in the decades to come for all these young people around the world to have a better future than our generation? And there's no easy answer. You know, in, in closing, there was a lot of lessons <coughs> learned, I think, with, uh, with the journey we've taken with the Networking Academy. And so what I'll summarize in, <clears throat> make sure you're experimenting and trying new things. Number two, it takes collaboration. Don't think you can do it alone. The more people are involved and connected, the better. The third is understand the outcome you're after right from the very beginning. Uh, if you understand the outcome, you can work towards it. Uh, Joe challenged the status quo, never, never do it. And the best advice I've ever gotten is look at the world through the eyes of a four-year-old. They question everything, and they don't see any limits. Absolutely true, and I would add to that, that I think to the success of the future, everything that we've discussed, the teacher does play a critical role, and it is a very different role from what it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, exactly as you described. If they took on more this training coach guide, the information is out there anyhow, but you need to show to the kids what is this all good for and what does it lead to, and make it just turn the way we teach around, make it more holistic, and really you know, guide them. I think that would make a humongous difference, and you could really have, see very, very fast progress. Three points. Uh, innovation. Uh, in spite of the efforts of some to mess it up, we still have the most innovative society in America in the world. And enormously creative young people who are able somehow from very poor backgrounds to be, uh, become successful. It's a, it's, it's a great story in America. Secondly, immigration. 
So many of the innovators are immigrants. And again, we're messing it up by not <coughs> passing comprehensive immigration reform and letting people who want to stay here stay here and fuel our economy. But the third point, to your point, Joe, about this disconnect between vocational training and, and liberal arts, many colleges now are conflating these. And you can do both. Uh, you can read poetry. You can also learn how to fix cars. Uh, I have a, one of my four kids actually learned how to do that in a, in a major university and loves fixing cars, oh, by the way. And I think it's not just fixing cars. It's developing skills that are useful, like coding and things of that kind that will get people uh, reasonably high-paying jobs quickly out of college. And back to the kid in Yemen, I think, sadly, we're a generation off before we know how to reach him, and that is a real tragedy. Okay, well, that's, that's it. The last, the last point I may, I'll make, which hasn't been made, all day today, all, all hour, is that we are facing a global problem with boys. Boys are falling behind girls. I think that in part that's because girls are naturally superior, but that's just my point of view. But I think that part of the answer to educating and training boys is moving from a two-dimensional classroom situation to a three and four yes. dimensional okay. form of education where they're manipulating keyboards, but also learning geometry by building houses and so on. Yeah. Uh, I think that we are well past the time when uh, the encrusted institutions of the past, and we've mentioned a few of them today, should be determining our children's future. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. I wish we had, had time for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you.